Today, I'm testing one of the most repeated woodworking myths. And not only did I figure out that it's wrong, but I discovered some really interesting stuff along the way. The myth is this. When you're gluing up boards, you wanna space your clamps as if the force from the clamp radiates at a 45 degree angle into the board and the V's that are created cover the glue seam. Shut up, nerd! Okay, I know it's a rule of thumb and it works, and who wants to pull out their calculator every time they glue up a board? Well, me, that's who. So I'm gonna build an absurd contraption to test something that does not need to be tested, and then I'm gonna tell everyone they're wrong. Let's see how that goes. So the claim that people make that I'm going to test today is that when you're gluing up boards, two boards in this case, and you've got a clamp or more on the edges of the board, the force radiates from the points where the clamp touches the board into the board inside of these V shapes, which are at 45 degrees to the edge of the board. And when that force gets to the glue seam in the middle, anything that's inside of the V shapes is gonna have enough pressure to glue and anything that's outside is not. So you need to make sure that your Vs at least touch and more likely overlap a little. So how am I gonna figure out how the forces travel through the board if I'm clamping from this edge and this is the edge that's being pressed against another board? Well, I wanna have some way of measuring force all along the edge. The way I'm gonna do that is with these load cells which have two strain gauges in them and when it's bent, the resistance of the strain gauges changes just enough that you can pick it up with a Raspberry Pi. I designed and 3D printed these holders and the load cells can pop right in here like that. And then I can line up the holders with the load cells in them on the edge of the board like this and hopefully detect the forces along the edge. Let's try. Just so it's a little easier to follow along, this is what we're gonna be building. There's the blue panel, and on that are three steel backing bars. Um, those have the yellow 3D printed holders for the strain gauges. And on the back, you've got that red thing, which is a backing block. So the first thing I'm gonna make is that blue panel, and I'm gonna do that just by cutting out a rectangle of plywood. And then I'm gonna take some of this steel bar stock, which is just a half inch by an eighth of an inch, and cut out three pieces that are the same length as that rectangle. The reason I'm using steel here is because when the load cells are getting pushed against, I don't want them pushing up against a plywood back, which they're going to dent into. I want something that's less deformable like steel, so when the steel presses on the steel, you don't get any movement introduced there. So then I'm just going to use those 3D printed holders as some guides to hold the three bars in place while I pre-drill and screw some countersunk screws in to hold it all together. Then I'm gonna cut out a little backing block, which is just gonna be three pieces of half inch plywood that are glued up into a big block. This serves essentially as the other board in the imaginary glue up. So it's gonna add some rigidity and prevent that original board from flexing at all as I clamp down from the other side. And then I'll just add a little spacer here to make the glue up a little easier and mount that backing block onto the back of that blue panel. To get any useful data out of the load cells, 
I need this analog to digital converter, which I can then read with the Raspberry Pi and use that to display the info on a screen. All right, so then I just had to solder up a whole bunch of these things. It took a while to do, but I made a point after I recorded to see how long each one took me to do. And it's just nice to see that after doing 10 of them, I was going about twice as fast by the end as I was by the beginning. So I got to learn something, which is nice. Then I went through and wired all those analog digital converters up onto a breadboard, which is fine for this kind of project because this isn't a permanent fixture. It's going to get used a little bit and that'll probably be the end of it. So no sense in doing a lot of extra soldering for that. All right, so the load cells are wired up to the Raspberry Pi. I can then put them into the holders and start loading them up onto the panel with the backing bars. On the left side of each of these load cells, you can see there's two little bump outs and those are there to keep the spacing between them consistent, but still leaving a little bit of room to run the wires between them. So each of those holders has two load cells in it and to distribute the force across those two load cells, I need a little bridging piece that goes in front there. I'm making these out of steel for the same reason as I made the backing bars out of steel, which is that I don't want it to be deforming against the load cell. Uh, I'm using this old cutoff jig that I had laying around because it's my best way of cutting metal in any consistent way. And I'll just cut these down to some two inch strips and then take them over to the grinder and clean them up a little bit before I put them into the holders on the panel. Okay, we're getting really close. I can clamp a board to the apparatus and read out some data coming into the computer. But there's a problem. What you see here is that putting some pressure in the middle, I get a whole bunch of readings, but the zero and one and eight are basically not reading at all. Number two is super high. And the reason that this is happening is because the little strips that I just cut out aren't all at the same height. So the ones that are sticking up the most are getting a lot more force and the ones that are down below aren't really getting any force. So I'm going to have to do something about that. To deal with the problem of the different buttons being at different heights, I drilled a hole in each of these steel caps, threaded it and put a screw in so that I can micro adjust the height of each button and get them all dead level to each other. I then went ahead and printed some little pucks, which are just circles that fit on top of those screws. And these are great because not only do they distribute the force across a little bit more area, but it allows you to go through and adjust each one till it is just pushing up against the edge of the board. So you can start your clamping off with a level playing field for each spot. All right, we are almost there, ready to run some experiments. I just have to do some quick calibration on the load cells. While we're waiting for that to happen, take a second to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the little bell. Thanks. Okay, so with those pucks set up, I can start doing some experiments. I settled on a procedure here where I can very lightly clamp the board down until I just start seeing some force applied. And then I can go through and adjust each puck until they all have one star showing, which is one kilogram of force. Uh, at that point, I know I sort of have an even starting point for everything and I can start clamping down on the board and applying force. I started off using boards that are 135 millimeters wide. It's five inches, five, five and a quarter or something. And clamping down the center point between the number four and five measuring spots. In this setup, the angle 
to the last puck on the edge is only 53 degrees. And the solid woods did a great job of covering that span. That's equivalent to one and a third board widths on either side of the clamping point. So in this case, 45 degree rule is okay, although a little more conservative than it has to be to get the full coverage. And also who knows how far past it's going or would go on either side of the edge. So how far can we go? Um, I don't wanna rebuild the whole device at this point, but I can make the boards narrower and move the clamp towards one side or the other of the setup to see how that affects it. The next set of boards I checked were 90 millimeters. Uh, it's a little over three inches. And I checked in three places along the length, right in the center again, and also at the number two and number seven measuring spots. Just a side note here, at some point the number three sensor just crapped out. I think I can still get a good sense of what's happening, but I do think that because I wasn't able to adjust the puck there just right, what was happening is that some of the forces that would have gone into that spot were going into the adjacent spots and you see some spiking on either side of that spot. Okay, so looking at the measurements with the clamp in the center on the 90 millimeter boards, we're still covering the full board width with the hardwoods and that's 64 degrees, which works out to be twice the width of the board on either side. So that's double what the 45 degree rule would tell us. The pine though, which is a softwood, seems to fall off around the number seven and number two marks, which is between 48 and 58 degrees. And it covered the full board at 135 millimeters, the big older boards, which is 53 degrees. So it looks like the pine tops out at around 55 degrees or 1.4 board widths. Okay, so the last thing I checked was putting a clamp near the edge, not in the center. There's a really interesting thing here, which is that you get more force at the edge than you do where the clamp itself is. It's like all the force that would have gone past the edge is being concentrated right up at that last point or the last few points. What's really crazy though, is that putting a clamp near the edge will severely limit how far it spreads in the other direction from the edge. This is because the empty space that's past the edge is kind of allowing the board to tip that way and lift up closer to the center. Also, just out of curiosity, I checked some plywood samples. They seem to behave sort of like the pine with a little bit more force concentrated right where the clamp was and less spreading out. I assume this is probably because the plies of the plywood that are running perpendicular, sorry, running parallel to the direction of the force are carrying that force really directly and not spreading it out at all. So you end up with more force in the center and less spreading out. So here's what I think. These are the takeaways. Uh, edge straightness is super important. It almost trumps everything else I'm talking about here because if your edge is a little wavy, you just don't get force in those low spots. Second thing, species matters a lot. It seems like hardwoods, the cherry, the maple, the oak, you can get two full board widths and the pine is more like 1.4. So that's a really big difference. One board width is really conservative for interior clamps. Uh, for hardwoods, uh, two is perfectly fine. And for softwoods, like one and a half is probably fine. The big thing though that I learned is to stay away from the edges. It really messes things up when you have a clamp right near the edge. You want to have your first clamp about one and a half or two board widths from the edge, depending on your species. Uh, I think this is the thing that the 45 degree rule is really causing problems with. All right, yeah, and that does it. I think I really learned something here today and um, I hope